Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode six of Space is Hard Vacuum with Cerberus. And today we are launching at double playback speed into orbit with the shortened Stiletto 1S launch vehicle carrying the regular ordinary Swedish science time Mark II probe. Yes, the Mark II, the big, the major, the more major redesign that I was alluding to in the previous episode while explaining how and why the Mark I, the various little iterations of the Mark I probe kept basically not working, tumbling sideways in the atmosphere and blowing up in spectacular fashion. We're going to see if we can't have a bit of a different outcome with the Mark II, which you will see in a few minutes as soon as those fairings pop open. In any case, the uh, the launch vehicle, I said it was shortened, and it is. It's uh, basically, I, I made everything. I made the, the launch stage tank a little shorter, the upper stage tank a little shorter. The solid rocket boosters are considerably shorter than the kind of retroactively named ordinary Stiletto 1. I chose uh, Stiletto, I think it's going to be... It's, it's, it's pointy, like the actual, like the, the little stiletto, like, not, not a shoe. <laughs> Although if you put on a force behind the point of a stiletto shoe, you can still punch holes in stuff. But, um, I think I'm going to name at least a lot, at least a lot, probably a lot, maybe most of my actual rockets, the, like, the, like the actual launch systems after, you know, pointy things, you know, daggers and swords and arrows and that kind of stuff the, because they pierce the skies or something I'm gonna go with it and you don't have to understand my reasoning that's just what I've picked so I'm gonna do it so now that we have this stiletto 1s s for short or small I'm gonna probably short well on its way into uh, establishing a, the beginnings of an orbit for our Mark II Swedish science time probe. Just testing out the, uh, the, what am I trying to say, the attitude keeping capacity of the new gimbal handling system. There's, uh, basically, it's, it's just, a, it's back-end code stuff. It's not really a big mod feature. I've just, uh, there's there's a new plug-in that sort of controls how the rocket nozzles twist and turn to gimbal and change your course. And with that, we get ourselves a little bit away from the lower stage. We're going to let that fall harmlessly back into the Atlantic. And eventually, <laughs> we might even light up the second stage. I think I'm coasting to Apoapsis on this one. Although, as usual... As I seem to do a lot, at least, uh, I leave it a bit late. I also tell... I, I have Mike Jeb do the circularization maneuver, which tends to... It just kind of points at the average of the direction you need to go, and so it ends up just pretty much pointing right along the horizon, so... Instead of doing the thing that I normally do, when I control it kind of semi-manually, and just have it climb gently up into an orbit. This it floats up and it just kind of burns in the average direction you need to go. And so there we are, pointing dead on sideways and hoping we can spit this rocket fuel out the back in time to actually have a good orbit before we fall all the way back into the atmosphere. And so... I'm not quite sure if this is just in my preview or not, but it's going to go into the commentary. I've just lost all the sound. I don't know whether or not that's actually happened. Uh, we shall see when this is when this is all done. If this is all mute, as it sounds to me, when you are watching it, well, I'm sorry. I'm not sure what happened. It's not giving me any sound anymore, and so it may not be giving you any either. In any case, I will zoom in a little better even a little better than this eventually, and you'll see the, the satellite itself. The good old Swedish, regular, ordinary Swedish science time, ROSST Mark II. You maybe caught a little bit of a glimpse of it there, and you'll get a better glimpse of it here right quite shortly. Um, 
the little hydrazine tank is now on top rather than between the heat shield and the probe. So uh, when the hydrazine tank is empty and therefore has very little mass left, it'll, it'll kind of concentrate the mass of the probe down near the bottom, near the heat shield, which we want because that's how you get this thing essentially to point in the right direction as it falls back to the atmosphere. At least that's the idea. We want it very, we want it bottom heavy so that it falls bottom first. And now I'm having a bit of an issue there. I have it, it's trying to automatically point at the maneuver node there, but uh, without a rocket firing and without a gimbal to do the trick, it seems, I don't know, I, I was having some issues there. Uh, I probably just didn't have my RCS thrusters properly balanced. I didn't really reposition them after resizing this tank, so that's probably my fault. But in any case, I think we've got ourselves we've got ourselves in orbit. The apoapsis is higher than I recall wanting it to be. And yeah, well, <laughs> look at this thing. It's just swinging around everywhere. I was just getting it at this point. I was trying to get it to just circularize right at this altitude because we've got lots of fuel to spare. And uh, rather than having it climb all the way out there, I just wanted it to, you know, just try to bring that apoapsis back down and just have it do a nice tight low orbit. But I think after after messing with this enough, yeah, I just I just got sick of it and said, fine, I'll just ditch this thing. I collected all the hydrazine that I could back into up into the probes tank. Although even then, it's it's not full. We used a lot of uh, RCS fuel with that thing wobbling around, trying to set its course. Much better here, though, with just the probe. Uh, much better balanced. It actually points more or less where I need it to in a pretty timely fashion. So that's good. I'll have to go back at some time in the future and rebalance the uh, rebalance the RCS thrusters kind of on that upper stage tank to try to get something closer to a good uh, a good center of mass balance. Although it may have also had a little bit to do with the fact that uh, I mean I, I was doing that with the tank almost empty anyway. So even if I do if I balance the RCS thrusters with the mass of a full tank, it's still not really going to work when the tank is almost empty. The center of mass is going to shift and the RCS still won't work. And here we have, speaking of RCS, it's overacting, a little, overreacting a little bit there when we came out of time warp. But we do have, I believe we've got our first full tank of data at this point, or at least we're, we're close. No, I think we have it all. Um, and the reason why I'm not certain is because I'm, of course, again, watching this in preview and doing commentary where the preview resolution is not, it's not 100%. Uh, things are quite uh, blurry, so I'm doing my best. But there we go. I know we had a full tank of data there because I just used it. And there we have another full tank of data after some manic time warping around the globe. We'll do the second experiment there. I'll actually leave it there a little longer this time because I'm remembering that I'm going to speed this up. And you see there that we've completed all the experiments and we have to bring the probe home so the, the Swedish government will pat us on the back and hand us a big briefcase full of science. And that second experiment there was worth 300. The first one, which I just kind of blitz through and forgot to actually stop to show to the viewers is worth 200. So now we just need to get this thing home. And the reason why I'm, I waited a few extra orbits here, the idea, which it didn't quite work as planned. I either left it too many orbits, uh, like too late, or I just misjudged the way things would line up. I basically, what I wanted to do was try to get it uh, a, to re-enter over the day side of the Earth so that it would, you know, be visible. And most of the re-entry attempts that I've done, whether I filmed them or not, have ended up on the nighttime side. And so those just don't really make for good film. 
So I'm trying to bring it down over the day side so we can see it. And I also, I wanted to bring down the path of the orbit. Initially, I was thinking to do it like right over North America, basically right over the U.S. I wanted to bring it over, uh, you know, Vandenberg in California and have it go basically right down in between Brownsville in Texas and Cape Canaveral in Florida and just have it fly right over that line of uh of ground stations so that even as it descended and i had the antenna in kind of undeployed mode like it is there with the shorter range i would still have control because i was still concerned about attitude control and using the rcs that just to just to maintain the uh the orientation of the probe i was i was still concerned that it wasn't that it wasn't going to work you know I, I was still trying to give myself i guess the best chance that i could and i figured the best chance that i could on top of designing the probe to fall a little bit more aerodynamically i also wanted to be able to control its direction if i needed to so now i'm using the rcs as rocket engines to lower that uh lower that periapsis i'm aiming for 80 kilometers and because the uh, because the thrusters are so low thrust, and because they're so throttleable, it's actually very easily tunable, and it throttles right down to almost nothing. And we can get ourselves a nice, neat periapsis, very, very close to 80 kilometers. Although then I realize that for starters, the periapsis is now well off in the Pacific Ocean, and secondly, with the extra time of orbiting around. Uh, another time after I thought I had it lined up, it's gone back out of line again. But I figure, oh well, if I don't have attitude control, I don't have attitude control. And then I notice that anyway, I barely have any hydrazine left. It's very unlikely I'm going to have enough hydrazine for the entire descent, whether or not I've got radio control the whole time. So I'm thinking, okay, well... At the, well, literally, literally at this point, I was thinking, I'll just kind of hope for the best, because not much I can do anymore. Just needed to uh, have faith in the design changes that were made and hope that they're enough to bring this guy down in one piece. Or at the very least, the probe core. The probe core and at least one parachute in one piece. Everything else can blow up as long as the probe core and one chute are still alive and working. Then we'll hopefully be fine. There are two parachutes on there. Uh, but I mean, if I don't have two, as long as I have one. We skip ahead there because that was literally, I think, eight or ten minutes of descending through almost no atmosphere and then... Like, nothing happens. It's just this thing floating. It might as well still be in orbit when it's up that high. There's nothing exciting going on. There's still nothing exciting going on. So I've actually got it on two times time warp, which I've got the two times playback speed on top of right now. And so um, we'll just uh, we'll wait for some... We'll wait for the, the exciting stuff to begin happening, which is usually bright orange and makes a lot of noise. And at this, you know, I'm just, all I can do is wait at this point, And all we can do is wait as we watch it happen to see if we can finally pull off a successful return of the regular, ordinary Swedish science time probe to the surface of the planet. We're so close now, we're only, we're, we're but 78 kilometers away from the surface, but... We can't really reach the surface quite yet because we're still going at almost 8 kilometers per second. And that's... This thing isn't designed to water ski at 8 kilometers per second. So we need to shed that speed. And now we're actually climbing back up a little bit. We uh, we bounced. We didn't bounce completely. We're, uh, we don't have enough speed at this point. I mean, look at the apoapsis coming down. We're, we're encountering lots and lots of drag now. So we're not going to bounce back out into orbit. But we did bounce back up into a climb, which is fine. If we spend a little more time up here, the, the, the more time we can spend 
shedding speed in a nice leisurely fashion up here. At least the more at ease I was at the time as I was recording this. There would have come a point where if I'd kept decelerating gently uh, at a high altitude, my trajectory would have gotten so steep that it probably would have bitten me in the ass on the at the end of it. Because then I still would have been going pretty damn fast and descending a lot more steeply. And uh, just slamming into that air just that much harder, which probably wouldn't have been very good. That actually, by the way, for those that aren't aware, and actually even people who do have a, a pretty good grip on this kind of stuff, people who are, you know, KSP players, may not know. Um, it's a it's a common misconception that this whole re-entry thing is because of, like, friction of air actually against the, like, the spacecraft, you know, the probe or the capsule or whatever the case may be. And that's that's not actually what happens. All that heat and the fireball and the plume and the orange glow and the all the excitement is actually, I mentioned slamming into the air, and that's what's happening. It, the air isn't heating up the craft as it passes over it. It's actually the craft is slamming into the air so fast and so hard that the air can't get out of the way and you compress the air in front of you. And you actually get to a point once it gets dense enough where you compress it so tight that just that actual compression is what makes the air get hot. And then that heat from you literally squishing the air ahead of you in such a huge, crazy fashion, that's what causes all that heat and fire effect, and that's what can that's what can kill you. It's what can blow up your satellite. It's what can kill your astronauts if you don't manage it, because that heat that's generated, it will eventually get into your craft, and that's what these beautiful heat shields are for. What this heat shield on the end of here is going to do, and what any of these ablative heat shields are meant to do is once we get into this point where we start to see all the crazy kind of shoots of flame looking stuff coming off the coming off the front of the craft the shield gets hot and it gets so hot that the outer layer of it just comes off burns away it, it ablates that's what ablation is gets hot and just detaches burns away and it takes that heat with it and then the next layer under that does the same thing, and it takes that heat with it. So the heat goes back out into the air around your craft instead of into your craft, where it can destroy it or roast the people inside or all of the above. Now we're getting oh, we're getting into the real good stuff here now. Down at 60 kilometers altitude, we're still moving at a pretty damn good clip. And we, uh, we get the real light show here now, pretty much from here until we... From now until we drop to a reasonable speed, we're going to get more and more and more and more of this. And uh, everything's still looking good at this point. Of course, as this is going on, I, I'm, I'm... You know, my teeth weren't chattering, but you might as well picture that they were. I'm sitting there, I'm, the, I'm literally on the edge of my seat because this is like the seventh time I've tried this and I really want it to work because... You know, I, I really want to keep making these videos and have something good to put up for them. And oh my god, what was that? I literally... I wasn't startled that time, but as I recorded, I, I jumped. I didn't know what that was. And I'm looking, and it, it turned out it was one of my RCS thrusters that I guess the, the, the craft was... Oh, have a look at this. See that? And there goes my... <laughs> there goes my radio antenna. I slowed that down for you guys. Oh, and there it is blowing up because it's no longer protected. But the first explosion was my RCS thruster blowing up on one of the four sides because I guess it was a little bit tilted into that heat shock wave and it just blew up. I wasn't expecting it and I, I, I really did. I, I jumped. I was like, ah, <laughs> what was that? Because, of course, I'm just deathly afraid of this not working. Look at this. This is real time now. This isn't two times playback. Look at that ablative shield just getting eaten away. At this point, I'm looking at my altitude, my speed, gauging how long it's going to take for me to finish this, and I'm like, this is going to run out. This thing is, oh, and then I get, like, oh, no, it's all going to, it's all going to go wrong, and things start blowing up, and just, they keep blowing up. 
<laughs> then finally, the smoke and dust and explosions settle, and the probe is still there, and it's really hot, but then I notice that it's cooling off. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> it's cooling off, and it keeps cooling off because the acceleration, the deceleration, is easing off. And see, there you go. The the light show's even over. Where we shed several kilometers per second of velocity in that short time, and so far, it survived. It's through the worst of it. That was that was the thing with the previous designs. They couldn't get through the worst of it. They didn't make it lower than 60 kilometers, and now I'm here at 12 kilometers, and it's made it this far, and it's actually... I, I realized finally that it still had one parachute. I did lose one of the two parachutes in that flaming, exploding mess when I thought I was going to lose the whole thing. But I apparently... <laughs> I kept a flag <laughs> and a parachute and the solar panels. But I think the solar panels stay there because they just don't get affected. And there's the parachute pre-deploying, slowing our descent to a much more manageable level, giving us a new, a new lease on life, or giving the little bacteria in this satellite, I guess, a new lease on life, maybe, provided they didn't get cooked. <laughs> in the heat after the heat shield exploded. But then here again, I have another bit of a nail-biting moment because I'm looking at my velocity, 400 and something meters per second, and it, it takes me a minute to clue in that, okay, no, wait a second, that's orbital velocity. And now, finally, I look at the altimeter, and I'm thinking, yeah, no, I'm not falling that fast, am I? The parachute deploys, and then I'm really not falling that fast, and then I go, oh, right. And then I switch it to surface, as you just saw. 6.2 meters per second. Much better than 400 some odd. 6.2 is positively, wait for it, survivable. At this point, I'm still, of course, a little apprehensive because I don't have the second parachute. And I'm thinking, okay, I designed this thing in the VAB. I designed the real chutes to work with two parachutes. They're designed, they're sized so that they're expecting there to be, they're expecting to have a partner. And I think, okay, we'll wait. The heat shield's gone, the thrusters are gone, so I lost a bunch of mass, too, so I'm lighter than I was. And I mean, six meters per second, I mean, almost everything can survive six meters per second, right? So I sit there and I think, well, again, can't do anything about it, and I finally just think, well, I'm pretty sure this can handle six. Let's see if it handles six. I think it handled six. We're in the water on the planet in the main thing that we wanted to be in one piece is in one piece i'd say we made it and at this point this was <laughs> at this point where the real real big sigh of relief happened so now here we are in the science center and i'm looking at the wonderful bounty of science that we've brought back with us that finally we managed to make it survive the trip Finally, we brought back those poor microbes that we were sacrificing to the, I don't know, the the universe gods, the, the deadly reentry gods. <laughs> we sacrificed many, many microbes and that they finally let us bring some back and study them and study the data that the whatever sensors were inside recorded. And now we have lots and lots of science, and I'm looking, and I think, okay, well, we have to get this Luna 1 probe, because I don't have any other probes left. And then I think, okay, let's have a look at that one. That's another moon-related one. So maybe we'll get that. Then I'm looking at Freedom 7. This is man stuff now. Finally, we can start sending Kerbals up into orbit and doing, you know, Mercury program kind of stuff to put it into perspective with, you know, like, the real world. Uh, American progression was they were, you know, that's, that's, we're talking like John Glenn, that kind of thing, the first people to actually orbit the Earth. But I grabbed that other moon related probe. Uh, so we have the Luna one, and then we have some sort of, I think it's similar to the Swedish biosample recovery, except now we're sending it past the moon. And we'll see more about that in later episodes when I actually send it into space. 
I'm looking around at some other stuff and I'm thinking, okay, no, this is a no-brainer. Got to get me some advanced rocketry. I've got to send stuff to the moon. I'm going to need a little more punch. And then I decide, well, hell, i got science left over. Let's grab the Freedom 7 anyway, give ourselves the option. We can do some Earth orbiting stuff while we've got probes shooting out to the moon. So there we go. We'll be able to improve the power and efficiency of all our old rocket engines, and we've got a whole bunch of new ones to play with with an advanced rocketry. I look forward to building those up. But in the meantime, that's it for this episode. Uh, a, a great epic success of an episode, I think, because the one thing I hadn't been able to do for weeks, I finally pulled off. And so I'm glad to finally be able to show that to you guys, and uh, I hope you enjoyed. And uh, I suppose I'll just, I'll see you next time, when hopefully nothing else explodes too violently. See you guys then. This episode of Space is Hard Vacuum has been brought to you by the number 510. And the word of the day is science. Happy kerbaling!